Hi, everyone. Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. You know, it's really surprising, but this month's show marks our third anniversary on the air with you. We hope you've enjoyed the programs we've brought to you these past three years, and hopefully for the ones in the years ahead. Our program for this month is about solar observing, and with me here in the studio is Ken Anderson. Ken, welcome back to the show again. Glad to be here. We're going to talk to our uh, viewers about solar observing. We're going to talk about equipment. We're going to talk about safety. We're going to talk about things that uh, you can see. And we're going to start off with, obviously, safe observing. Our parents and our teachers always told us, never look at the sun. But we're telling them the opposite. So how can we do that safely, Ken? Well, you, you're exactly right, Don. Uh, you, you shouldn't look at the sun naked eye. Uh, you should always have safe, approved solar equipment. Um, and you can get that from uh, an astronomy shop, and I'll be talking about that in, in this portion. Uh, because if you do look at the sun with unapproved stuff, you can do uh, eye damage and cause blindness. So it's really important. Very, very important indeed. Now, I see you've brought a number of pieces of, of equipment, so why don't we get right to them? Sure. Um, the first one that I have over here, uh, this is my 25 power 100-millimeter uh, aperture uh, uh, binoculars from Apogee. Um, and what I have on the front uh, is uh, a, a white light filter. And uh, um, you can order these from uh, Orion telescopes. And uh, um, this is how you make your uh, regular binoculars into solar binoculars. And what these do is they block out 99.999999, so the sixth decimal place, percent of light to make it a safe eye level uh, to observe it with. Now, when you look at, when you look at uh, these type filters, uh, you will see sunspots, uh, both the umbra and the penumbra. And uh, you can see that on uh, the slides that show the different solar filters. Uh, some of them, some of the white light solar filters are blue, some are white, and some are yellow. Um, so that's what you see with this one. And this next one that I have, this is actually a camera lens. It's an 86 millimeter zoom, 130 millimeter to 600 millimeter zoom lens that I used with my Canon A1. And uh, and uh, it has a doubler on it. So this has the uh, same white light solar filter, and it's on a regular, uh, normal camera lens. And I did, I did take pictures of the, 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 the last transit of Venus with this one. And you can see that uh, on the slide uh, when I was with my uh, two younger daughters. This next. Uh, telescope. This is Gordon Hansen's uh, personal solar telescope, or PST. And um, this one is 40 millimeters aperture. It's uh, 400 millimeter focal length. And uh, these are the cheapest way to observe the sun with hydrogen alpha. Now, hydrogen alpha is uh, um, it enables you to see excited hydrogen atoms, um, just like neon light gets excited, and you can see it as a pink light. When hydrogen gets excited, uh, you see it as a red light. And on this slide, uh, you can see the bomber lines where the electron falls from the third to the second shell. And that emits off a red light, which you can see in the spectrum. And then there's also other um, emission lines that hydrogen uh, emits, but uh, this solar scope only lets you see that bright red light. And this is a personal solar telescope. And uh, you can see the prominences, the granularity, uh, um, flares uh, with uh, this type of solar telescope. And this is uh, a, a bandwidth of uh, 6,562 .8 plus or minus one angstrom. That's how tight the tolerance is. So this scope here would allow our, our viewer to look at flares and prominences and other things that they wouldn't be able to see in these white light. Filters. That's right. The white light, okay. you only see the sunspots. And this, you see a lot more. 
Great. What's this next setup, Ken? Um, this next setup, this is my personal uh, uh, Solamax 40. It's the same size, 40 millimeters, as this one, but uh, this one gets down to 0.7 angstroms, and if I put a double filter on it, so like another one like these in front, I can get it down to 0.5 uh, bandwidth of the tolerance of the system. And uh, this one, you, you focus back here, and you can tilt the filter up in the front, whereas the PST, you're tilting the filter with this knob and the whole tube kind of tilts. Both of the, both the, the, the solar telescope, uh, the zoom lens, and this PST would be mounted on a tripod, similar to what I have here. The last uh, telescope that I have over here, this is a regular reflector telescope, and what I'm going to talk about here is, and, and it's really important, I have it, the eyepiece angle downward, is you're not using your eye to look here, but instead you're doing solar projection, just like Galileo did and uh, people did before they had solar filters. So the light comes in here, and I say use a reflective telescope because the, the, the heat gets so hot that you can actually damage a refractive telescope. And when I did eyepiece projection, the glue in my eyepiece actually melted. So use your cheapest eyepiece. And this is a drawing that my kids made. Uh, and you can see the picture of when they were with me um, observing the transit of Venus. So here's, here's uh, some pictures my kids made. They just traced it out. And uh, this was mine um, of the transit of Venus. So the light comes through here, and you trace it out on the paper plates. Ken, we'd uh, like to thank you for bringing this information to us about safe solar observing. If you'd like to get some more information about this topic or any other, please go to our website. You can see the address there at the bottom of your screen. And right after our upcoming events, we'll bring you John Schroer with What's Up in Tonight's Sky. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the show. We're here talking with Ken Anderson about sun and solar observing. And right now we're going to talk a bit about some of the basics of our nearest star. Ken? Thanks, Don. Um, the sun is our closest star. Uh, by definition, it's one astronomical unit, which is equivalent to 93 million miles or 149.6 million kilometers. Um, that's also equal to eight light minutes, which is how long it takes the sunlight to actually reach the Earth. Now, I mentioned it was 149.6 kilometers, but it's not exactly a, a pure circular orbit. Um, it's 147 million kilometers at perihelion on January 3rd, and it's 152 million kilometers at aphelion on July 4th. Um, its eccentricity is uh, 0 0.017 which is very close to a perfect circle, which is zero. So the sun doesn't vary that much in distance when it's closest versus when it's farthest away. No, not that much. Um, the next closest star is Proxima Centauri, and that's 4.3 light years. A light year is how long it takes sunlight to travel in a, in a year, right. how far it goes. Mm -hmm. And compare that to the eight light minutes that it takes the light to reach us from the sun. It, it's a much further distance to our next closest star. It sure is. Um, the next uh, fact that I have is uh, the, the spectral sequence of the star is a class GT, G2, or it's 5,800 degrees Kelvin, and it's plus 4.8 absolute visual magnitude. By definition, the sun's luminosity is equal to 1 or it's 26.7 uh, uh, negative apparent magnitude. The brightest thing in our sky. 
And that's why we have the day for 12 hours on average. Uh, and then the, when it's behind, behind the Earth, uh, then we have nighttime. That's a diurnal system. Um, as far as mass goes, the sun consists of 99.8% um, mass in the, the, the solar system. Only 0.2% of the mass is in the planets, the moons, and everything smaller. Um, the Earth, uh, Earth masses would be uh, 333,000 Earth masses to, would make the, be the equivalent of the Sun. And the average density of the Sun is uh, 27.9 times that of the Earth's surface. So our Sun is basically an average yellow star out there in the universe. Average by our definition being average being the closest one to us. Right. Yeah. Um, as far as the, the breakup of the sun, 92% uh, hydrogen atoms, but only 73% hydrogen by mass because hydrogen is a very light atom with only one electron and one uh, proton. It's 7.8% helium atoms or 25% helium mass because a helium atom has four protons and neutrons in it. Um, the next highest element is oxygen and it's only 0.6 percent oxygen atoms, but that small percent makes a 0.8 percent oxygen mass. Now, as far as uh, the sun goes, um, we get its energy and light from the nuclear fission from hydrogen to helium within the core. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the sun is currently in its midlife. It's about 5 billion years into its 12 billion year life. Um, where it would end up as a planetary nebula or a white dwarf. Now, our sun has cycles that it uh, goes through uh, relative to sunspot activity. Can you fill our audience in about that? Sure. A lot of people talk about the sunspot cycle being 11 years, but when you couple in the magnetic cycle, because the poles switch every 11 years, it's actually a 22-year magnetic cycle. and. Um, the, the, average, the average sunspot cycle is 11 years, but it can be as low as 8 years to 16 years. And at maxima, there's up to 100 or maybe a little bit more sunspots on the sun that, that you can see and look at. At minima, which we went through last year, there's zero, so you don't really see anything in a white light filter. Exactly. Some days it was just blank white. That's correct. And then also, if you look at the... The, the solar cycle plot, um, you can see that there was a mortem minimum uh, between 1645 and 1715, and that was when they had a really low sunspot activity, and uh, they think that was tied to much cooler temperatures on Earth. And uh, last year was a pretty low, fairly low uh, minimum period, too, and we think we might be going into the next minima. Wow, we're not even getting so much back into that typical minimum maximum cycle. Right. So these sunspots are something that we talked about in the first part of the show that really m something interesting for our folks to see. Uh, what other types of things uh, should they know about the sun? Okay, well the next thing we'll cover is uh, what, what you'll see on the sun, and that's basically the sun's outer layers. Now the sun consists of, the outer layers has the photosphere, and the photosphere is basically what we see in the sun with our naked eye. And this is also the part of the sun that you see with a white light filter. So uh, the temperature of the sun on the photosphere is 5,800 degrees Kelvin. And therefore, it has a black body radiation of 5,000 angstroms, or we see it as yellow or slightly yellow orangish. Okay. Um, the next thing about the photosphere is... Uh, uh, the sun's diameter is 1.39 million kilometers, uh, or 109.3 Earth diameters. So this is how big we see the sun in, the, in our sky. Um, and it has a, an apparent magnitude of minus 26.7, or like you said the first time, the brightest thing in our sky. The, the photosphere does rotate every 24 days and 16 hours um, at the equator. But it's not a solid body. It, uh, 
it rotates 28 degrees at 40 latitude and 36 degrees at 80 latitude based on the sunspots. Now coming up in May this month on the 20th, uh, something very interesting that people can observe with the sun is a uh, solar eclipse. What can you tell us about that? Sure. We have the solar eclipse uh, coming up and uh, you can see that at Kensington Metro Park um, and you can see less than half the eclipse uh, before sunset. Now will now, some you, of the astronomy clubs be out there to provide observing for people through their scopes? That's correct. You can be out there for that. And then also um, on June 5th we have the transit of Venus coming up and uh, that we're doing solar observing at 5.30 at Kensington Metro Park at the East Boat launch site and uh, you can get get there off of I-96 uh, exit 151 or 153. Now I understand that these transits uh, occur in bunches. We just had one in 2004, another one coming up this year. Uh, it'll be 117 years till the next one. Uh, I think we have a video that'll demonstrate this to our viewers. That's true. If you look at the at transitofvenus.org um, you'll see a lot more details about the upcoming transit of Venus and it's a very interesting video. Okay, well we're going to take a few minutes and show you that video right now. Through the years, Venus has passed quietly between the Earth and the Sun. Then on a Sunday in 1639, Young Jeremiah Horrocks was the first person to witness this transit of Venus with a telescope. And he recorded the planet's silhouette against the sun. In ensuing centuries, astronomers used this rare alignment of Earth, Venus, and the sun to answer a leading question of the day. How big is the solar system? In anticipation of this rare event, nations sent out a fleet of explorers across the globe to time, to the second, how long it takes the disk of Venus to move from one edge of the sun to the other, which takes over six hours. From this early gathering of data, one could calculate the number of miles to the sun and to all the planets. Enduring the hardships that come with exploration, International expeditions set out in the 18th century, and again in the 19th century. When the last transit of Venus occurred in 2004, a fleet of spacecraft and modern telescopes observed it from a new perspective. And people around the globe watched in awe. Planets are once again aligning for the last transit of Venus in your lifetime. Though nearly as big as the Earth, Venus is dwarfed by the massive Sun. On June 5 or 6, depending on your location, you can witness this elegant dance of the planets. Meanwhile, the Kepler spacecraft is looking outward in the direction of the Swan, near the Summer Triangle. There, it detects the telltale dimming of stars, discrete and periodic dips in brightness that reveal the presence of planets orbiting their host stars. Notice, as the planet transits, there is a drop in the amount of light from the star as depicted in the graph. So far, the Kepler spacecraft has found hundreds of candidate systems. In the past, transits of Venus helped us to determine the size of the solar system. And today, the transit method helps us to discover new planets. One day, we might find a planet similar to the Earth in June 2012. Come, witness the transit of Venus, enjoy the science, and marvel at the solar system in motion.
We hope you enjoyed that video on the transit of Venus. If you have any questions for us about that topic or any other, please send us an email. You can see the address down there at the bottom of your screen. And uh, coming up next is Term of the Month with Steve Whitty. Stay tuned. The Term of the Month for May 2012 is SN 1987A. Now, SN, that's supernova. 1987, that's the year it was discovered. And A, that's the, the order in which it was discovered. This was the very first supernova discovered in 1987. It was, in fact, discovered on February 23rd, 1987. Uh, these days, we discover multiple supernova every night. Um, so we wouldn't be on A toward the end of February. We would be, you know, we wouldn't even be in single letters. It would go A, 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 B, A, C after we run out of the alphabet. Uh, it was a very interesting supernova because it was, in astronomical senses, it was, it was nearby. It was in the large Magellanic Cloud, which is visible from the southern hemisphere. We'll, we won't see it here in Michigan. Uh, what's interesting is that it's 168,000 light years away, and that's pretty close. That's almost as good as being in our own uh, galaxy. Um, we have studied the Large Magellanic Cloud quite a bit over the years, and we have images uh, which include the progenitor star, the star that exploded in, in a supernova. And it turns out to be a blue giant. And this is rare. Most type II supernovae, and this is what SN 1987 was, most type II supernovae come from red supergiants, not blue supergiants. And as a blue supergiant, this was kind of unusual. It was about one-tenth as bright as uh, would be expected. So there are lots of theories about why that is. Um, in the image, uh, you'll see that there is this ring. And this ring didn't just appear when we saw uh, first light when it, you know, back in February of 1987. They didn't, uh, they didn't appear, the rings didn't appear for several months. And that's because the, the ring lit up when the shock wave struck material that had been ejected from the progenitor star first. So the progenitor star fluffs off huge amounts of stuff, and then the shock wave from the explosion then runs into it. Uh, there's another kind of interesting thing. Uh, that was a first at the time, which was that there were three neutrino observatories that were operating at the time that the light came to us, right? So 168,000 years ago, the star explodes. Uh, 100, you know, back in 1987, the light finally makes it to us. But also some neutrinos appeared, and they appeared at these neutrino uh, observatories uh, about three hours before the light was discovered. And that's because neutrinos were able to bore through the body of the star uh, easily, whereas the light took some time to get out. Uh, so that was the very first uh, time that a neutrino observatory was used for an astronomical observation. SN 1987A, that's the term of the month. What's up for May 2012? Well, we have a full moon on the 6th of May. And, you know, it's big and bright. On the 12th of May, we have third quarter. So that's an, uh, a, a late night morning object. Uh, on the 20th, we have kind of an unusual feature. We have a new moon. But since a new moon is between the Earth and the sun, uh, every now and again, the moon blocks the sun. And we actually have an eclipse. Now, for Michigan, we have a partial eclipse. But for a path across the United States, we have an annular eclipse. What happens is that the moon is um, farther away from the Earth. So it appears smaller in the sky than the sun does. So when the moon is farther away, it doesn't quite cover the sun. And you get a ring of sun all the way around the moon. Uh, but we're not in the path uh, in Michigan, so we get a, a partial eclipse. You just get a chunk of the moon uh, taken out of the sun. And that's a lot of fun. And we'll be, um, uh, 
we'll be able to see that. Then on the 28th uh, of May, we have uh, the first quarter moon. So that's a, a, an evening object. Uh, Venus is, uh, is visible in the west uh, just before sunset. Um, and it's much better in the early part of the month than the later part of the month. Uh, by the end of the month, we're, we just about lose it. Uh, Mars and Saturn are visible essentially all night long. And uh, so Mars is in the upper right there, uh, just a little uh, west of south, and Saturn is a little east of south. Uh, Saturn uh, just had its opposition, so it's as big and as bright as, uh, as it gets. And it always puts on a great show. Uh, Mercury and Jupiter are really too close to the sun to see this month, or really uh, next month. Uh, May 5th and 6th, we have a meteor shower. We have the Eta Aquarids. They're a reliable shower. They give you about 10 meteors an hour. And the, uh, the little streaks across the sky, they come from little dust grains that uh, follow in the orbit of Halley's Comet. Now, unfortunately, we have the full moon you know, on the, on the 6th. So that does uh, put a damper on what you'll get to see. But if you get out to a dark sky site, and you look especially in the mornings and probably after the peak, after the sixth, so that the moon uh, is heading toward third quarter, you might be able to see a few more. Just look uh, at any part of the sky that isn't where the moon is. You know, you should be better off looking away from the moon. Um, so uh, not in May, we have in June, we have on June 5th, the transit of Venus. In 2004, I took this picture by using what is essentially a monocular. And I taped a piece of white paper to a notebook. And I did what's called eyepiece projection. You can see on the sort of the right side there, that is the sun. And that is the uh, sort of the disk of Venus, that little dot there on the sun. So that's what's up for May 2012. Look up. See the greatest show on Earth. Thank you.